Welcome to the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Welcome to ITSP Magazine. Knowledge is power, now more than ever. Marco. Sean. Vroom, vroom. Here we go. <laughs> Just we're, we're, on the we're road. Taking, Just on the road. Riding our drone up to San Francisco. Oh, that was a drone? Vroom, vroom is a drone now? <laughs> <laughs> Propellers. <laughs> Sounds like this scooter I used to have in Italy when I was 16 years old. I thought oh, the drone was a different noise. You know. That was a well, drone before. Whatever it, it is. Drone. That's right. <laughs> You, Whatever you it is, it. You, don't, you don't hold on to the handlebars. You just kind of go, right? Kind of yeah. Pulls itself. It's, uh, it, it was the original self self driving uh, <laughs> bicycle, <laughs> motorcycle, whatever whatever you want to call it. I'm yeah, lucky okay. to still be here to talk about it. But no, yeah, exactly. we 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 are excited. We're talking about going uh, to RSA conference in San Francisco, and uh, and we're going to space too. I mean, let's let's bring it there. Right. There's a lot of activity in space, which is cool. And we get the pleasure of connecting with many of many of the folks. We haven't even have a couple channels on the topic here on ITSP magazine, which is really cool. And uh, it's great to listen to a story. Great to read a book. Great to watch it on TV. But when you can get your hands on stuff, that's when it gets really cool. And that's what's going on in the aerospace village during RSA conference uh, in April at the end of the month. And uh as with most of the villages within the within RSA conference, there are many sub villages, many things are going on within them, and and we're going to talk about uh, some of the things that the group at CT Cubed is doing, and we have Adam and Chris on to help us understand what that's all about. So thanks for uh, thanks for being on, guys. Yeah, thanks, thanks for having us. And it's it's an all volunteer thing, which is important to point out. This is a, a group of people coming together to do good things for society specifically in aerospace. Uh, I want to hear a little bit about that and your history, uh, both you and, and, and Adam and Chris, uh, kind of leading up to your role, what you're doing now. So brief peek into who Adam is and then uh, pass it over to you, Chris, for the same. Sure. Well, thanks. Thanks again for having us on. Um, name's Adam Scheuer. Uh, I am a uh, currently a retired vet. I spent 23 years in the Air Force and I, got, uh, I retired in 2020. And after that, joined up with CT Cubed. So I got to work with Chris and, uh, and the other guys. And that's kind of what led us here, um, kind of aviation background with the Air Force, however, uh, from a cyber perspective. So I think Chris will also mention, we we're both cyber warfare operators in the Air Force. Um, did that for our careers, various uh, aspects, you know, leading organizations to um, down in the the beeps and squeaks of uh, getting the technology working and running for the Air Force, securing their missions, um, and also, you know, doing some offensive and defensive work there. So that's a bit of my background. I'll pass it over to Chris. Before you do that, we Oops. have a, a mystery guest joining us. I'm going to let uh, let Hank in. He, oh, can, Hank. he can have some fun with us and uh, move things around. All right, so Hank, we're in full swing here, but uh, we're going to pass the mic over to Chris for uh, an intro to who he is, and then we'll then we'll come back to you. Sounds good. Thanks. Yeah, as Adam mentioned, uh, he and I met in uh, in the Air Force. So I was at the Air Force Weapons School actually as one of his students, and I went back there to be an instructor. Then I finished out my time uh, with the Air Force Red Team. Got to do some interesting things along the way, and we got out. We had a you know, our hypothesis was that the skill set that we learned at the Air Force Weapons School uh, cyber warfare course would translate to the commercial sector. And so we set out on a on a goal to do that. It, you guys have any experience with the Weapons School at all, by chance? Does that name ring uh, a bell? Not, not on either side, thankfully. Okay, so <laughs> let's, me tell, uh, <laughs> let's me tell a little story here. So what happened is, like, back in the 70s, 80s, the, the rumor is Hollywood was looking to to make a movie about an elite, you know, DOD training institution. So they went to the Air Force Weapons School. And the Weapons School said, hey, we're, we're way too busy. 
doing elite warfighting training. You should go see the Navy guys, you know, over at Top Gun instead. And so we like to tell people, you know, Top Gun, weapon school, they're kind of closely related, but the, you know, Top Gun is 13 weeks, weapon school is twice the length, we're almost six month long course. And then I didn't get to play any shirtless volleyball at all as I was going through the weapon school. So <laughs> we do some things, we do th- some things different. <laughs> but uh, what it is, it's actually an instructor course uh, at heart. So we we uh, we really have a passion for training, realistic training, right? Relevant training, and that's what led us to uh, to launch. We figured out that you know you can't. We our our philosophy is you can't just be a training company. You have to actually do engineering work or do analytical work as well as training just to stay current, right? That's our philosophy. So you, um, otherwise, things could just kind of stagnate. And so as that, as we went out and started uh, trying to figure out how we would translate our skill set to the commercial world, it led us into doing some work with the Boeing company, uh, specifically their product security engineering workforce. And that led us to build a system of systems we refer to as the mouse, Adam will talk about a little bit later, so that we could have a realistic training platform to teach the students the skill sets they needed to learn. But the problem is if we start identifying vulnerabilities for live weapon systems that, are, that the DOD is using, things get classified pretty quickly. And we don't want anyone getting in trouble, right? But we do want to have realistic training. So we built something that would allow us to do all of the same things that occur within the cybersecurity maturation methodology that Boeing developed without anyone getting in trouble for security classification guidance reasons or any sort of intellectual property spilling where it's not supposed to. Uh, and then that's uh, that's what we'll be taken out to the sandbox at RSA in its virtual form. So I'll pause and I think you wanted Hank to say some words as well. Yeah. So AKA Henry, uh, who's been on with us as well. Good, good to have you on for this too. And, um, yeah, maybe a, a quick intro to who you are, but also an intro to the broader aerospace village. Uh, yeah. I apologize peek. for my lateness, uh, today. Uh, that's all gentlemen. good. Uh, you oh, know how it goes. We, we were hiding from happening. you. We don't yeah, know how you're We're, you're we're not supposed to start until three minutes from now. So you're actually you're actually early. <laughs> uh, anyway, my, my name is Henry Danielson, uh, aka Hank, and uh, part of the Aerospace Village, and working with CT Cube. Very excited to see your uh, live wares, if you call it. Uh, and, and I'm uh, especially excited to talk to you about Space Grand Challenge and how we could integrate some of the learning to um, high school students. Uh, specifically, we're going to be using Unity Rooms this year. And uh, again, and Gamer, if you're a gamer, you know what that is. Uh, but we're going to have a, a, what I would like to do is a sneak peek of uh, a, a rover or a robotic, um, you know, I'll just say rover, uh, up up on the lunar surface, fixing a NIC, a network interface card. Um, and I'd love to have that um, discussion with you all of uh, what you think about my idea and is this plausible or you're shooting to the moon, Henry, uh, or you're, you're uh, way out of weight base. But anyway, I work at the California Cybersecurity Institute. Sorry, I have ADHD, LMNOP, hyperactivity, and ADD. So uh, that's why I'm all over the place. But I appreciate... Um, your your support and i cannot wait to see you all in aerospace village uh we are going to have a, a phenomenal time and it's going to be really good and thanks for the intro today i appreciate it well we appreciate having you here so i i guess uh adam and chris is kind of like what uh what hank started here you know the the importance of experience but what what are people going to experience because our job is to have people watch this and then flock to the aerospace village. So what, what right. they can expect with you there. Sure. Uh, you want to take it, Adam? Or you yeah, want to sure. It? So, so just for, for all the viewers, so to put a, put an image with what's going on here. So this is about a quarter uh, of the size of what it would be in the real world. Um, so this is our mouse. This is the platform that we designed uh, system of systems um, contains the major subsystems you'd expect to find on any uh, space or air platform, mission computer, navigation, uh, communications. So those types of subsystems, uh, when you start to put them together, can get very complex. And even just at the notional level, um, we've run our platform here through some uh, threat modeling software. And just with the subsystems we have, 
Uh, there's over 200,000 attack vectors given different threat actors uh, with something so simple. And this doesn't even exist in the real world, to be honest. So this is notional. And, and if you if you could, Adam, two things. Yeah. One, describe what you're holding. It's, sure. It's, you said it's a system of systems, but it's right. it actually is something. And, but, and then the other thing is, when you, when you maybe if you can describe the attack vectors. Attack vector okay. doesn't mean vulnerability necessarily. It just right. means a way in, right? So maybe if you can kind of describe a little bit of that too, that'd be good. Sure thing. So. Uh, this is the third version uh, that has evolved for us. It started out um, as a, a, tra a tra tank tread vehicle, uh, and then it moved to mechanism wheels, and now we have the flying version. So for, for anybody, we could go back to use those other ones to demonstrate a system of systems, which really is a kind of a fancy way of saying uh, there's not just one component in this. Uh, there are several components and subsystems that are dependent on other parts. So, for example, uh, using we'll use the attack vector uh, uh, kind of definition. So this has to be flown remotely. So there's someone sitting somewhere in a container on the ground or in a building sending signals. Uh, could be direct RF energy or it could be up over a satellite to control this remotely. So... If someone were to say, get into that control station because there's uh, some access that's unfortunately there, uh, that is an attack vector that could get all the way to the system, to the mouse here. Um, I'll take a step back. The mouse is a fancy acronym uh, we came up with. It's a mobile optical ultrasonic sensor explorer, not a backronym. We, we came up with that first and then we fit the letters. Oh, also, let, let me add a note for the people that are not watching the video, but they're actually listening to the audio version of this. The mouse, it doesn't look like a mouse. It looks like a drone. Exactly. So that's what Thank you're you. holding in your hand. So people exactly. just think about that. Is a drone. drone right? Is a drone. <laughs> exactly. So if you've flown like a DJI or any other kind of drone that's out there, um, very, very similar. Just picture that, except ours is CTQ Orange. Um, so yeah, so we're going to bring this. However, I'm pretty sure if we were to actually bring it, uh, RSA folks wouldn't be happy if we flew a, a quadcopter drone indoors, probably a safety issue. Um, so we're bringing it in three forms. Uh, we have uh, put it into a hollow lens, so mixed reality, if you will. So you can fly that around the, the open, uh, you know, the open convention area. Uh, we brought it, we're going to be bringing it in a MetaQuest 2, so straight up VR, virtual reality. Uh, and then uh, most recent one is we've put it on a, on a tablet, on an Android tablet. So it's kind of another version of, uh, of AR. So that's, uh, those are three different ways. And then the, uh, here's the, you know, dangling the carrot out there. If you come fly it, you're going to get your wings. So here are the mouse wings. Nice. Um, you those know, we will yeah, only, yeah, one yeah, little to, bad. only one way to earn those. Yep. Yeah. It's a little, you know, put it on your, maybe we'll get some pins. You can wear it. Uh, but yeah, nice. so earn your wings, come fly our mouse, come talk to us. Uh, we can talk about everything that I just mentioned in regards to attack surfaces. Um, talk about different threats that the, uh, you know, aerospace industry is facing. You know, what do they have to think about? Uh, these aren't traditional Windows systems that are just up there that get patched. Normally, there's a lot that go into these aircraft and other space systems, uh, different considerations to think about. I'm, I have a question really quick about um, the VR, um, the Quest 2. So uh, if I brought mine, is there a possibility to get it on there to try it? Or you're going to have some Quest uh, gogs, if you will, for us to try? Uh, we're going to have our own equipment, but if uh, We'll, we'll give you a sneak peek if you're interested. We'll definitely hook it up and push it to yours if you're interested. Awesome. I yeah. just want to show my son. Who we trust you. Yes. Uh, <laughs> not coming to RSA, but uh, let, let him try it. So sure that's And the idea with the uh, platforms to um, tie everything together. So what we found with engineers, uh, in particular systems engineers, they can spend uh, many years working on a problem set. And we, and we consider this to be a wicked learning environment. If you're familiar at all with the concepts of wicked versus kind learning environments. Um, and the simplest way to say that is that in a wicked learning environment, feedback may be non-existent or very delayed. So if you make a poor security decision on a space platform, you may not find out that you made that poor decision for a decade 
or ever. You may never know that something you did was a result of some vulnerability or error, uh, unless it just, you know, uh, something unlucky happens. So what we've done is, uh, again, this thing is complex enough as a system of systems that we tell the engineers here, here are attack vectors you need to consider. Right, here's some extra things you have to think about when you're not just doing enterprise IT. And then we have them actually fly it to complete a mission so they can get that operator perspective while we actually attack it from a red team perspective. Right, then we'll take advantage of anything they failed to properly secure. We'll show them exactly how we did it and then give them a chance to iterate and do it again. That that has really resonated uh, with the students that have been through this type of course. There's, there's something about getting that operator perspective that makes them think, you know, I never want to put the operator of any system I'm working on in the same place. I didn't like the way it felt. In real world so, environment. That's awesome. Just saying. Let, that's awesome. Let, let's talk about that, uh, Henry. That That's a good lead in. Uh, some example without giving away top secret <laughs> situation, like some scenario so that the audience is not familiar with this type of attack and what actually look like in real life right so sure. what what is the consequences for you know an airplane or a, sp a space shuttle is not flying anymore sure. but for a satellite for a rocket for anything that flies so what could go wrong sure so an, things, an easy right? example to yeah so so many things right limited only by your imagination uh, so <laughs> exactly. one of the things with the with our mouse is it it's actually collecting information it has an ultrasonic sensor on it it has a eoir camera. Um, an easy example to look at from uh, very recently is uh, attacks against uh, any sort of smart home device that has a microphone on it, right? So there are some security researchers found that, you know, that microphone is taking in information from the environment, passing it into the system, and then depending on what it talks to from there, some interesting things can happen. So what these folks found is that they could be a few blocks away on top of a roof and use a laser to stimulate the microphone of this device. And it could tell that microphone, you know, the laser could make the microphone think that it heard, hey, go ahead and open up my garage door. And then boom, the garage door opens, right? So now that the engineers know that's possible and they've got to see it, they can do things to mitigate, right? You can, it could be as simple as not letting the device be near a window where a laser can get to it. It could be putting some sort of filter to stop lasers. It could be, adding a challenge to say, hey, you just asked me to do this sensitive action. I'd be glad to do it, but tell me what two plus four is, right? Which the adversary wouldn't be able to hear. Uh, the way you can then start solving it um, becomes very interesting as well, but you have to just even understand that this was an attack that could have happened in the first place. And we have a whole list of those. Yeah, without We don't want to give away the secret sauce, obviously, of all the surprises you'll see in the course, but that's a pretty easy one to uh, wrap your head around. Yeah, because I'm. You said it could be decades or even never that you that you experience uh, a vulnerability being exploited, mm -hmm. um, and it makes me uh, kind of a, like a parallel. First, I want to go to the, the ocean. There are things in the ocean, similar things, right? Lived down in the ocean for a while, mm -hmm. but also I'm thinking like medical devices, um, where you're inserting something in your body, like a pacemaker or an insulin pump, and those things have uh, an expected lifetime and they're probably not going to be patched anytime soon. So you're kind of building these things, knowing that they're going to be in a place for quite a, quite some time. Now in the medical world, we have the FDA kind of ho hopefully helping to mitigate some of that risk with uh, controls and, and release cycles and things like that. What's the equivalent in, in the aerospace and is it, is it airplanes versus space travel versus satellites? Uh, did, are they separate things or what, what's that landscape look like, for lack of a better word? Um, I'll take this one. Uh, so I think we're just realizing that it exists, that, that concept that you kind of just went through, that, oh, no, we have to think about this stuff for the future because uh, we have to do, you know, secure by design is a word that starts, it gets, gets used a lot these days. Um, I always like to refer back to like the B-52. Um, it was, I think it was awarded in like 1946. They're like, hey, contractor, go start to make this. And it first flew in 1952 and it's still flying today. So those, those folks had no idea what the internet was back then. Um, 
So the the idea I think that you kind of just have to go back to is that secure by design idea. And it has to last however long it might be out there. And the shelf life of the of the B-52, it's just going to keep going from what we can tell. Like there might there might never be an end. They'll just keep modifying it and adding new widgets on it to make it still effective. Um, so yeah, can can something be just deployed like in a medical field? or in an aircraft and can it exist as it is or will there be reoccurring maintenance? Does it have to come off, get calibrated, go back on? Uh, those are all design decisions that engineers have to think about as they're going through uh, the design process. Uh, so in some instances, maybe medical device that goes in you, um, the expectation is it will stay in you forever. So therefore, you got to think through all those considerations of how long could that be in someone's you know, inside someone helping them live, and then what could go wrong, uh, the what ifs, you know. Uh, so can't plan for everything, but you got to at least be able to prioritize what are the most likely uh, things that could happen and apply those resources to try to make sure you, you mitigate or stop them from happening. And Hank, um, kind of on this same topic, because it, I mean, there's been a lot of emphasis on IT security and information security uh, in the enterprise and in, in government operation departments, right? Things like that. Uh, where we're looking at Windows and Linux and, and mainframes and, and common protocols with standards and frameworks driven by government entities to say, this is kind of how you build stuff. Here's how you best practices for securing it. Um, the OT world, and probably even more so when you get out to the fringes of, of some of the things that, uh, that your teams are looking at, how, how do people, and obviously we're, um, we're talking about the aerospace village and, and the work that you're doing here, but how do people start to get a sense of what those systems are? What are the protocols? What are the networks? What are the applications? What are the communications to, to begin to understand what, what needs to be done for, to, to reach that secure by design that Adam's talking about. Yeah, I, th I think personally, um, there's uh, amazing researchers out there that are publishing, doing books, doing papers, academics. Um, how, how do people find out about this? Um, and I'll just, I'll just say, you know, I definitely think in the aerospace village, uh, anybody that's going to be hanging around with us and the partners that are there would be able to discuss IoT devices. I know that we're going to talk uh, a little about the cloud as well. I mean, at some point, um, space travel will be, uh, and other companies are doing that now where they're actually using cloud-based systems to be able to control um, CubeSats, for, for example. Um, so back to your question about IoT, I think, and uh, OT, um, there, there's so many things that, uh, we have to know now. So for example, maybe at, at one of the, uh, academic institutions, they will teach secure security by design and have them look at a current product that's maybe two, three years old that wasn't designed, uh, with security in mind. Uh, and they'll come up with maybe how can we encrypt something? How could we encrypt something from the endpoint to uh, all, all the way up in, into space, into outer space? So I think that uh, getting people to understand at the Aerospace Village that we want to educate people and get people to understand uh, there's a cool thing out there right now called Sparta uh, that talks about a matrix and it's kind of a mashup of miter and space. Uh, that would be something that I would always lean towards right now. That's a newer technology that not necessarily newer, I should say, but, uh, and it's by the aerospace corporation, which is great. They're sharing how to protect outer space. Um, so that would be something that I, I would want to always reference back and then think about MITRE and how attack surfaces are and, um, look at them. So educating, uh, the, the people coming into this space is really uh, a huge passion for me and trying to get young people involved in this or someone that maybe is on the, I don't know, maybe they're in the medical uh, information research and they want to flip and come over to uh, the space or aerospace era. I hope that answered that. Sean. Yeah, that's really cool. It actually kind of made me curious about a question about you know the future. I always 
kind of have a weird mind. I, I like to think about the future looking at the past. And and when you look at the future in, in what you do, how, how do you actually kind of predict how far can you look into the future, even if knowing that even the, the most advanced technology now could actually be de deployed with malfunction or bugs or things that we just couldn't even think about. So is, is it like more of a cultural approach that we need to, to switch and really think about it? everything from different perspective or is just impossible really because the complexity of of things so uh, chris maybe you want to you want to throw your uh, opinion here sure yeah i think there's a way to abstract and look at the fundamentals of uh of what we're dealing with of the problem set that'll that's not going to get outdated here just because a new vulnerability comes out or a new like apt actor is found. So we've, we've talked about attack vectors several times, for example, if you, at the end of the day, there's energy, you know, entering and leaving your platform, all attacks will have to start or, or end with one of those paths. It's like, if you can understand that, right, you, you can at least start to understand uh, the general attack surface to your platform. Then it's, yeah, as we, as we, um, get more mature, it's how di how deep we dive into each of those threat vectors, right? So then you have to understand, you know, the difference between Windows, Linux, um, embedded systems that maybe don't have a traditional operating system, real-time operating systems. And then it's just, then, it, then it's the constant uh, cat and mouse game that's been, in, you know, been in place with security for millennia, right? So I think that we can, we can teach the mindset and we can teach fundamentals that'll, that'll last people's entire careers. And that's, that's the place we tend to operate right now. Like get everyone that solid foundation and then you expand on it and grow as you mature in the field. That makes sense. Kind of like the, the main rules and then we can go deeper from, from here. Uh, Adam, anything you want to add on that? Uh, sure. Just the, the fact that uh, like Chris mentioned, once you have documented your attack surface, um, other than the, the wrench attack, where someone just comes up and starts banging on your, your system, or you know maybe the evil astronaut out in space doing a spacewalk starts hitting on it, um, from, a, from a cybersecurity perspective, that is the, the understanding of everyone who's involved is that those, those lines in and out for the attack surface. And once that's understood, uh, like I said before, you can start to rack and stack. Where's the highest risk? You know, you know, limited resources. No one has a trillion dollar budget. No one has all the time in the world. So that's when you start to take your smart folks that are on your teams and say, all right, we're going to go after the top three issues related to these these threat vectors. And we need to figure out how real of a threat they are. And do we need to change some system design? Do we need to add some uh, tactic techniques and procedures if something bad does happen because we can't mitigate it all like what's our response so that it really becomes a holistic approach uh, once you understand that so it does go back to culture for sure and just the foundation of uh, what what do you know about your platform and speaking of foundation uh students hank your, your thoughts on this from uh, from an education perspective kind of I mean, secure by design starts with a secure mindset by, by design in my mind. So what your, your thoughts on the future of this? Yeah, I, I do think that uh, more universities as we are growing are designing courses and are giving uh, young people the opportunity to be able to have uh, that mindset and think in that mindset and learn by doing, which is Cal Poly's motto to try to, you know, be able to get their hands on something. Um I know that um, we, we, we try to support the student as far as we can, but I also think in reality, if they leave directly from an institution, they may, they may be one of the only people that are coming to the new organization with that, with that thinking, uh, just because it's, it's currently in flux and in change. Um, but I do really feel like uh, all the universities out there that are that are teaching cybersecurity and specifically in space, um, what I would suggest uh, is in the aerospace arena that they have courses now that the students are required at least one 
on security by design or security in general, how to secure an airplane, how to secure a drone, how to secure uh, a, a spacecraft or, or a satellite. That way they understand um, how things could be compromised and they get just a little bit of understanding of what that could be. So I do think it's interesting because I think we're in a flux and maybe Chris and Adam can expand on that in your corporation when you're trying to hire a, a young person or an entry level human um, and you ask them, do you know anything about security design, security by design? They may not have that skill set or maybe they do. And I, I'd love to know um, when you're when you guys are you all are hiring, how, how's that coming up with you? And maybe I'm wrong. We're not in a flux where it's just at the middle part of that. Yeah, we sorry, we don't have any great input there. We don't uh we're pretty small and we don't tend to hire entry level just where we're at. So okay. we haven't had okay. to solve that problem just yet. <laughs> okay, awesome. Yeah. But it's an interesting conversation and and one that I would would encourage folks to have. Guess where? The aerospace space. Space. <laughs> <laughs> at the sandbox. I mean, that, this is one of, one of many, many things I think folks uh should be talking about uh, education and training and cross training. We talk about healthcare and maritime and, and uh, there's, there's a chance to learn from each other, public, public, private sector, commercial academia. Uh, we all need to come together and uh, generate awareness, build the foundation, continue education uh, and, and move things forward. Cause as we've pointed out, uh, the stuff's going to live for a long time. We better, better get it right as best we can <laughs> as early as as early as we can. And uh, with that, if you're an executive, if you're a uh, business leader, if you're a practitioner or a security analyst, come visit Adam and Chris and Hank in the uh, aerospace village. Marco and I will be hanging out in there as well, um, doing stuff with Boeing, doing stuff with, uh, with uh, the drone and uh, having these conversations. So, and Hank, if you don't mind, I'm going to make a T-shirt that says entry-level human. I really like that definition. <laughs> I think I want to record, I want to get a domain with that. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, you know, we, we are excited. And also, you guys are going to be in great company there with the IoT Village, the ICS yeah. Village, and uh, Dark Art, and Pen and um, uh, Ops, uh, what is the other one, Sean? Wait, going to be Upsec, there. Upsec, yep, yeah. that's right. And, uh, and I think there are some pop-up village as well i haven't really figured out what that is yeah, but uh, you know, cyber games has a, has a yeah. thing going there in a pop-up so yeah, yeah. All, tons of good stuff um great people again I'll, i mentioned in the beginning this is all volunteer um so go support support the crew uh be part of the crew and uh help, help move these things forward of course stay tuned to all of our coverage of rsa conference including other chats with the villages we have some stuff with iot coming up as well and uh yeah all on itspmagazine.com forward slash rsac it's all right there stay tuned join us see you in san francisco everybody thank right. you see you there see thank you, awesome. you. see you soon subscribe we hope you enjoyed this conversation if you learned something new and this story made you think then share itsp magazine with your friends family and colleagues. If you represent a company and wish to associate your brand with our conversations, sponsor one or more of our columns. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey. You can always find us at the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. <laughs>